All right, we're back with a, another guest, Ken Thompson. How you doing, bud? Tell Good, us who you sir. are and what you do, bud. Yeah, so my name's Ken Thompson. Uh, I'm an Azure Technical Specialist, and I look after open source software for Australia and New Zealand. So what is an Azure Technical Specialist? Well, uh, so I'm in the global black belt team. So, uh, so you guys are like ninjas and stuff? Is that yeah, nice? definitely like ninjas. Nice. Like ninja cats. A ninja cat, yeah, of course, of yeah. course. Um, so we look after uh, like the premium workloads on Azure, so emerging technologies, so big data, Internet of Things, uh, open source. And so you are primarily involved with open source? Yeah, and I go kind of across at Azure all up, mostly fo focused on cloud infrastructure, so virtual machines, containers, uh, workloads like that, but also cover app service, um, HD Insights to an extent. So tell us about OSS and Azure. Is that an important thing to Microsoft? And tell us why. Massively important. Um, and the reason it's massively important is because it's really important to our customers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, at the moment, over one in three VMs uh, are Linux-based. We're seeing the majority of new deployments are Linux-based as well. So that's a definitely a continuing trend uh, in Azure. And we have really great support uh, for Linux as first class citizen. Awesome, so for this particular session, you have something to talk about specifically. What are you yeah. gonna talk about today? Yeah, so I wanted to show like uh, some of the native integration that we're doing kind of across the board. Uh, so both in Azure and also in uh, Visual Studio Code and, and a bunch of different services in Azure that you can kind of stitch together to do uh, open source uh, container CI CD pipelines. So, Pretty, pretty popular at the moment, right. Docker and containers, and um, you know, building continuous integration pipelines. Uh, and you can come and you can use Visual Studio Team Services, um, that's fine, and, but if you're used to using things like Jenkins and Docker and, and Linux, we have really great support for those uh, systems too. So you mentioned containers. For those that haven't, don't know about containers, what is a container? Is it like a VM? Is it not quite, not quite a VM? Is yeah. it like a real machine? Tell us about that. So it's not quite a VM. Uh, so in a virtual machine, we virtualize our operating system, and then we have our application dependencies uh, and our actual application code. Uh, in a container, we're not virtualizing the operating system. Uh, we're just virtualizing our application and uh, our application code, and then we share the operating system between containers, but we still have uh, logical security uh, and resource separation through technologies uh, in either Linux kernel or Windows kernel, depending where you're running those containers. So for containers, is it only something that you can do in Linux? Can you do Windows containers? You can do it in Windows now. So you can do uh, Windows containers since we released Windows Server 2016. Um, you can do Windows containers, and then you can do Linux containers on Linux. Uh, because they share the host kernel, you can't run Windows containers on Linux OS or vice versa. I see. Um, but the cool thing is that uh, we're using the Docker runtime and Docker format in Windows, so despite them in different uh, systems, you can use the same tooling, the same orchestration, the same registries uh, to manage both platforms. If you're on a Windows machine, does that mean you can't do Linux-based containers? Or can you create a VM and then do the containers in there? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, great question. Um, so you definitely can develop Linux containers on Windows, and that's I'm going to show some Oh, cool I, integration. I almost, that's that's you a see good that? segue. I, like, I laid it up for him. To, okay, so spike it. Yeah. Spike it, Ken. Right. Tell us about that. So um, I guess for starters, um, we've got Docker uh, on Windows. Um, so basically, you install Docker on Windows, and it'll use Hyper-V um, to run a, a Linux virtual machine. Uh, and then it's basically piping all your commands uh, and your runtime through that virtual machine so you can uh, develop and test uh, Linux containers on Windows. Which is super nice, because I remember a time when Docker did not use Hyper-V, it used something else, I don't, yeah. and I had to install it, I had to turn this other thing off, and then I had to do this thing, but now it's super nice yep. to do, really easy to install. Exactly. So we talked about containers, what is Docker? Is Docker like software to make containers? Yeah, so, uh, so Docker's a couple of things. There's, there's Docker Inc., which is the company that started the, the Docker project, and then um, what's, what's usually referenced is uh, the Docker container format, so it's a, a specific way of packaging a container, uh, and also the Docker runtime engine that you use to, to execute that. Um, so definitely by far the most popular container um, ecosystem out there. Docker Inc. themselves have got some great um, Docker native uh, products available uh, that are available on Azure, um, and they're very focused on you know, making it easy for developers and very developer friendly. Uh, All right, 
Well, let's do this. So your computer fell asleep a little bit, so we'll yep. wait until we get it back. Let's go into a demo. Show me how easy this is and why I should be using it. Hopefully, you yep. can turn your screen around closer to me so I can see it. All bit. right. There we go. Cool. So <clears throat> we'll cover a couple of things first. So uh, this is the Azure Marketplace. So on here, you can get a bunch of um, you know, container offerings. We've got Azure Container Registry, private uh, Docker registry, because you don't want to be pushing your enterprise applications up to Docker Hub for the world to consume. So let me let me back up, because there's a, I have a thousand questions, and Ken, you're going to help me, hopefully. Good. We went from Docker, which I understood to be something that I do on my machine when I'm testing, to now stuff that's happening on Azure. So yep. what, what is this, what are these services on Azure, and what do they do, and why do I need to use them? Sure. So. Uh, a container registry, you're going to build a Docker image, and then you need to push it to a registry. It's, it's, it's an artifact repository for containers. Ah, I see. Now, is that is that container, is it like a virtual container where it has, these are the base things that we have, and then we use that to build other containers? Uh, yeah, so you can use that. We'll, go, we'll have a look at that. Um, you'll have base images and also compiled images up there, and then when you want to run them on servers, they're going to pull it from that registry or that artifact repository. I see, so effectively you're not building like a whole container every time. You're saying, here's my base container, yep. and then here's the application. So for yep. example, if you're running Ruby on Rails, you might have one with Ruby already installed, and then you're just saying, okay, now here's my application that goes on top of that. Yeah, exactly. And it makes a new thing. So to make it clear for the uh, folks, if we cut back to the screen, there yep. we go. Um, this is what you're referring to. This is a, this is Docker files. So this is how we build our Docker application, and we say, you know, this one is a node application, so we want to take this base image uh, developed by uh, Docker, um, and we want to install some dependencies. We're going to put our code in here. Uh, we're going to expose the port, and then we're going to tell Docker, when you run this container, this is the command you need to execute my application. I so see. So this makes it really nice for developers because they can control their dependencies, so there's no discrepancy between ops around, you know, I'm on PHP version 5.3, not 5.4, and you didn't install the right dependencies. So they have control of all that. They can package it with their app. And likewise for the operators, whether they're getting apps from the Node team or the Java team or the .NET team, they all come in the same format. Um, the commands to start the application are part of the container itself. So it makes it super easy for them to manage you know, a fully heterogeneous uh, applications. And so that's what the registry is. It's going to have a set of images that you've made that yeah, all of your so this is gonna this is gonna build an image for us and then we're gonna have to push push it up to the registry so we can run it in our servers. Okay, so I'm, maybe I'm getting confused. I'm thinking of a registry as a set of base images. So it has both. So Oh okay, yeah. okay, okay. So Makes it'll sense. so this node, if we were pushing to Docker Hub, this node image that lives in Docker Hub, um, and then I would build this image and I would push this up as my node app or something else. Um, and it will refer, uh, it will build and build a full image including that, that node so, base. So you said Docker Hub and you said registry. Are those yep. the same things? Yes. So Docker Hub is a public registry. Okay. Okay. And what Azure Container Registry is a private registry. So Docker Hub is public. So you don't want to push your most intimate enterprise applications up for the world to consume. Oh, you want to have a private secured registry uh, that you can use. And we, we give you a really simple like platform as a service style registry that you can uh, really easily spin up. So I'm spitballing here. And yep. let's, let's pretend that this is our super important node app. Yep. And all of a sudden, it's super overloaded. There's going to be some other system that's going to go to our private registry and say, I need another one of those. Uh, yeah, yeah. It'll, okay. um, you can spin up the container. So maybe we'll, um, let's uh, build the app. Okay, let's do it. And we'll see, no, we can, we can see all that. Yeah, I'm getting ahead of you because I have thousands of questions about cool. it. So I just want to touch on the marketplace. We've got heaps of Docker solutions. Uh, in there, container service is one. Um, so container service is uh, a way to deploy uh, Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, or Mesosphere DCOS. They're like the three most popular Docker orchestration framework. So when you want to run a Docker uh, platform across multiple hosts, you need to think, do things like service discovery and storage and networking. And that's what these platforms look after. For or or they, do they look after the container health as well? Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. So those are like the operating systems that pull containers out of registries, shut yep. things down, start things up, yep. make sure they're all networked properly. Yep. That's what the container service is. And you can choose from, you said, DCOS, yep. Mesosphere, and Kubernetes. 
DCOS is Biomesosphere, DCOS, uh, Kubernetes, and Docker Swarm. Got it, got it. I got and they're it. all fully open source, got so it. it's the exact same stack that you can run on-premise or another public cloud. Um, yeah, so lots of op options there. So I've already got a, um, I've got a Kubernetes, so I've got a container registry here for Ignite. We've got our private registry up on Azure. I've also got a Kubernetes cluster, which I've deployed from Azure Container Service. So go back, what, what did you set up here? Is this a container in, on Azure? This so this one, is this one right here. This one. This is uh, Azure Container Registry. Oh, okay. So that has all of the the container images that yep. you built. Okay, got yep. it. So that's my where I'm going to put my images. And this would be the OS for all of the. Yeah, and this is where I'm going to run my applications. Perfect. Um, and then I've also stood up Jenkins, which is very popular. Um, sure. It's like a open DevOps source, pipeline. Yeah, yeah, DevOps pipeline tool. Um, and. So we can go uh, into my application in VS Code, just wanted to talk about code as well. We've got a lot of integration for, well, firstly, VS Code can run on Mac, Linux, and right. Windows. It's, it's open source itself, it's awesome. Um, and it's got a lot of uh, integrations integrate open source tooling. So um, let's, well, first, let's update. We're going to vote on beer and pizza. So we're going to build a voting app. Okay. So beer versus pizza, which is more important? Um, and By the way, if you have questions as he's doing this stuff, please make sure to submit them because I want to ask. I feel like I'm hogging him right now. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to submit them. All right. So I'll update this. This is our voting page. And we've also got a... It's like something else in Python. Right? Results page. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just put this in and then I'll show you what the application is that we're building. So I'm going to save this. Um, I'm going to quickly cut to, let's have a look at this. This is what I'm uh, putting together now. Okay. All right. It's loading. No, so you, you are on loading. a, yeah, so it, it, Here we you, go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. It's loading. Yeah. Cool. All right. So this is what we're doing. We're in Visual Studio Code. I'm modifying my application. The application here. Uh, is a voting application. So if you're familiar with the Docker voting app, that's what we're building, that's what we're changing. Okay. And it is a, it's microservice architecture. We've got five different services. They're all in different languages. So we've got a voting service in Python. We've got a Redis in memory cache. We've got .NET Core, which is a worker service. Uh -huh. We're running Postgres as our database. And then we've got a Node.js uh, result service. So these are five different containers that five. together make this application. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Cool. So if microservice stack, uh, just demonstrates the power of using um, Docker as a packaging format and runtime because uh, we build all these containers in different in different frameworks and languages, but the way that we deploy and manage them same. is all, all the same. So really cool. Um, so we're going to push it into, we've got some integration into Jenkins, so we're going to push it into GitHub. Jenkins is going to have a look at uh, GitHub and see that we've pushed a change. It's going to build it. It's going to push it out to Azure Container Registry that we saw, and then that's going to deploy my app to my Kubernetes cluster. Okay, And Kubernetes then we're going to have a look at the app. And then if we've got time, we'll also have a look at operations management suite because an uh, important part of DevOps is getting feedback for your applications. And in operations management suite, okay. we've got Docker native tooling to you know, pull uh, monitoring and log data. All right, let's do it because I, I feel cool. like this is a really important demo. All right, so we... One second while we get your screen there back. We there we go. All right. So cool thing in, uh, in code, we've got native integration into Git. So I can say, um, you know, this is my beer and pizza changes, vital changes to my application. I'm going to push that. And then I can run a Git push just within uh, VS Code. Of course. We've got Git integration. Could also jump down into my terminal here if I wanted. Um, while we're here, We've also got a, a Docker extension, uh, which can create Docker files for you. So we had to look at one earlier. Um, it'll, it'll build them for you. We can run the Azure CLI natively, do a bunch of cool, cool integrations into Docker. So that's going to push our changes up. So let's come back to our app. And we'll see here, we've caught uh, Jenkins has seen a change uh, in our code. So if we jump into that, um, this has checked out our latest changes. And I've built a pipeline that's building, uh, oh, it's getting excited and going down to the uh, shell there. 
Um, so it's doing parallel builds of those different containers. And, but there was five before, but there's only three that changed. Right. So three I've got custom code in, and two are from Docker Hub, and they're just so Redis cache and the Postgres database. I didn't need to do any oh, code changes. because they're just they're just yeah. basic. I just want to run a cache, and I want to run a database. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm just making changes to my results app, my voting app, and the worker. App. So that is also going to go out uh, to my Kube cluster. So it's built my containers, and now it's going to go and deploy my application. So if we come back to our Kubernetes cluster, so this was the cluster before. There was nothing there, nothing up my Kubernetes sleeve. Touch wood, the demo gods are working with me, which they are. And we can see now that we've got our five different container stacks. Well, deployed. I'm glad you sacrificed the chicken before <laughs> this so that the demo gods would be appeased. Yeah. Because this is, this is a distributed system you just mm -hmm. pushed out. Yeah. And, and we've also, because we're using things like Kubernetes or Swarm, they're declarative as well. So we can do things uh, like here I've said for my results app, I want four copies of that application. And it's going to go out and manage the scaling. So we're talking about before, you know, how do you scale up uh, applications. Um, I can go in here and, and edit the YAML here. It's getting a bit you know, deep in the code. That's, I'm okay with code. We're, we're good. But we can come in here. There's the replicas, right? Is that what I think you're looking it's for? That one. Sometimes I change the wrong one. Because um, sometimes there's a definition in the deployment, there's a definition uh, elsewhere that doesn't actually make the change. But let's go with that. Oh, it looks right, like it's four there now. So now it's got six. Um, and they're pretty quick to spin up. So they might have already spun up, which they, they have. Are. So really easy to scale up, scale down for load. Um, and nice because of the microservice architecture, we just scaled the result app then. So by itself, we didn't have, need to scale each, you know, all those five components as like a monolith. Uh, we only need to scale the microservice that we need. So can we see the actual app running? Yeah. So let's go here. So one of the cool things about Kubernetes on Azure Container Service, as with the other orchestrators, is that we uh, provide integration into Azure itself. So what Kubernetes has done, I specified for my result app that I wanted that load balance so I could scale it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to externalize it to the world. So I wanted to create a, a service that was accessible from the internet. And it's gone out to uh, Azure. And it's created me a public IP in Azure. It's created me a load balancer in Azure. Holy and cow. it's hooked that into my application natively. It didn't have to do anything. Um, and it's all actually. Uh, native Kubernetes stuff. So I didn't specify any Azure stuff. It's just the integration between Kubernetes and Azure. It's making I all that see. Happen. And so now the public external endpoint is this IP address 40. Yeah, so I could hit that. But I've added that into Azure DNS. Because okay. we can do DNS nice. in Azure now. So uh, if we go to vote on Azure, so this was my previous app. Now we can see our new app. Uh -huh. So vote.onazure.io if you're watching and want to have a vote. Beer and pizza, tough choice. Uh, I'll go pizza every yeah, time. Yeah, pizza. So we vote for pizza. Now we'll go here. It's got our old uh, old code in there, but you'll see there it's updating in real time. And that's a different app. That was a Flask app that yep. was running in Python. Yeah. The voting app was a Node.js app running on Node. Yeah. And then you had three other VMs: one running Postgres, the other running uh, uh, Redis cache, and what was yep. the other thing? So Postgres, there was a .NET walk, Worker as well. Okay. So um, yeah, so we've got someone else's vo voting online, which is great. Fantastic, um, thank you. And you'll see if I change my vote, you know, it's going to update real time. So that's going through. When I put a vote in, that's going first to the cache. Then the worker's picking it up. It's writing that to the database. And then it's being displayed on this results app uh, in the back end. And you know, we're stringing together those five services uh, simultaneously. Um, yeah, so I feel like it's, there's a lot of, like there was a lot of magic dust you sprinkled everywhere. <laughs> I kind of want to know, like there had to be some painful work that you had to go through to get through it, or was there not that painful work? Is this something that I can do if I have an application that I want to set up this way? This is definitely something you can do. Okay. And, even uh, me. I mean, yeah. you're, okay. You're and saying that even I can do this. If you are here on Thursday or if you're watching the sessions online, I've got a session on Thursday, which is hands-on uh, Docker, Azure, and CI/CD pipeline. And I'll spend 60 minutes, and we're going to build this from scratch. So obviously, I've got this environment stood up, but I'm going to show you how to go from nothing to building 
Azure Container Industry, Jenkins creating the pipelines, spinning up. Oh, uh, you doing that in an hour? Systems. You're doing that in an hour. In an hour. It's going to be fast. This guy. Seriously, that's amazing. Yeah. So I really, I really like this. For those that may not be able to go to your session, or for those that watch it online, is there a place where they can go to see the code for this? Yes, yes. So um, let's go to github.com slash me, Ken Thompson. Oh, they changed the, they changed yeah, the Yeah, they updated oh. it to black. It's no longer oh, blue, it's all, This is the know. first time I'm seeing this, yeah. people. Okay. Black is the new black, apparently, on yeah, GitHub. Yeah, apparently. So uh, me, Ken Thompson is my repo, an example voting app, which I forked from Docker. Um, and in here, uh, I've got the Kubernetes deployment uh, config. I've got my Jenkins uh, Groovy script to create that pipeline. And being a little bit busy and lazy on documentation, as uh, as most of us usually are, but Docs I will. Is the last thing I will, we do every yeah, time. Yeah, last thing. So after my session on Thursday, I'll update the um, the readme with instructions to build it. But if you if you know a little bit about Kubernetes or Jenkins, you can go and grab the stuff and start hacking away now. So we have about nine minutes. You said you want to talk about Operation Management Suite. I did. I Tell did. us about that. All right. So Operations Management Suite. Uh, if you've not heard of it, you can think of it like an evolution of System Center, but it's run uh, in the cloud, so it's a software as a service based okay. solution. Um, it supports Linux and Windows as operating systems. It supports on premise, uh, whether you're running uh, Hyper V or VMware. Uh, we support Azure as a cloud, obviously, but we also support other clouds like AWS or Google if you've got workloads elsewhere. Um, so you can uh, do a bunch of cool stuff with, with OMS. You can do automation. You can do log analytics, uh, security, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So, so I understand this from a perspective of like, you know, application insights. Yep. I don't understand this from the perspective of Kubernetes multiple container stuff running. Yeah. So you're going to tell us how this sort of, how those things go together. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, so we've got a container solution in, in OMS uh, to preview. So we've got it here. Um, so let's open that up. So this is a preview of Operations Management Suite that goes into Container Solution. Yeah, so Operations Management Suite, GA, the container solution is in public preview. Um, and yeah, you can go and you can enable it. Uh, it's not. And this is looking at all the containers? Yeah, so this is looking at my whole cluster. So it's looking at my, um, so it's going to do a couple of things. It's going to pull uh, logs from the servers uh, and logs from my containers. And it's also going to look at performance metrics of, of my containers. Um, so I can see memory performance, CPU performance uh, of my different And that containers. literally just started. I mean, it's not like you're just making this up stuff. Yeah, so I started at, uh, you can see, 8.53, that's when I, kicked my environment up this morning yeah. to make sure everything was up. Um, and we actually, uh, to set up OMS, uh, it's pretty easy on Docker environments. So if we go back to um, Kubernetes, so we actually ship the OMS agent as a Docker container. And if you go to the docs.microsoft.com, our new doc site, um, in uh, I think in the Azure Container Service, uh, part of the documentation, you'll see how to enable OMS in Kubernetes. Um, so Kubernetes has got a, apart from running your containers, uh, it's got some other concepts, and one of them is called daemon sets, uh, which is pretty much purposefully designed for use cases like monitoring, where you want to run a daemon, and you want to run one of them on each of the nodes in your cluster. So I created a daemon set uh, here and said, I want to run OMS agent. Um, I give it my uh, configuration for my OMS workspace, and then it's going to go and suck data from that node in the containers and push it up to OMS, and then that's what we're seeing here. Do I need to do anything in my application itself in order to enable logging, or does nope. it just happen? Like, like, what is it logging then? Uh, so the OMS container is using the Docker socket, so you'll have to run the container as a privilege. So we talk very early around, um, although containers share the same operating system, they're, they're separate and they're secure. Uh, this one we're giving escalated privilege, basically. So it can talk to the host and it can use the Docker daemon to uh, 
introspect and pull out logs from containers and also from the host. So in .NET, usually I do like a debug .write line. Is that the kind of logging that will it will be picked up? Um, I think by default we're going to put uh, anything from from syslog on Linux. Um, so if your logs are going out to the standard Linux log okay. um, location, then we'll be pulling them out. Awesome. Well, Ken, this has been super fast. Is there anything we missed that you want to add in the last minute or two? I think we covered everything. It's a bit of a whirlwind. There's yeah. sticking a lot of services together, but I guess the important thing is that um, you can do you know, open source solutions really great on Azure. We've looked at kind of native integration between the developer environment on Visual Studio Code, Azure Container Service, Azure Container Registry, running Jenkins on Azure, and running a bunch of open source uh, languages. So really, as a first class citizen, super easy to get started. We've got a bunch of services that are just going to accelerate your open source projects. I really, I really like, appreciate this, because the thing that, that I found most useful is if I want to write a little web application, there's no reason why I can't containerize it and just spin up a Postgres thing, a Redis cache, and my little web app, and just have it all happen in Kubernetes really yeah. easily. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for spending some time with us, Ken. No Coming up next, so. we have a breakout session with the, of course, awesome Troy Hunt, Applied Azure, building a large-scale real-world application on a coffee budget. And I looked at his website. He gets millions and millions of hits a day. And so we'll see that coming up next. Make sure you stay tuned. And after that, we'll be back here with another interview with uh, Ada Stevenson and Duncan Hunter. We'll see you then. <laughs>